Sunshine Waiter. I'm Dick Williams, who's sitting in for Wade today, our, our president. Well, I can't take it off, I guess I'm good. All these regulations, I don't know what to do. Anyhow, we're pleased today to have a discussion of something that's been only 20 miles away from us for since 1848, and we really don't know an awful lot about the Oneida community. We know a lot something about it. We know we have a great-granddaughter of John Humphrey Noyes here today, and a, a, a granddaughter of historian George Wallingford Noyes. Carol White is here with her new book, by the way, which she'll talk about. Carol has had quite an extensive background in various things. I've known Carol since the 1970s. We both served on the village board. Remember those days? And she also was on the village planning board and has been active in various community activities here and in the community, in the greater community, the League of Women Voters, the United Nations Association, the Utica Food Bank. And about 15, 20 years ago, she and David started walking, walking up mountains. And somebody said, why do you walk up mountains to get to the top, right? Is that the, is that the answer? And I congratulate them, they both have been up, what, 46? All 46 of the high peaks up in the Adirondacks. I've been to, I think, one of those high peaks, so. Uh, Anyhow, congratulations to both of you for that achievement. I'm, I'm jealous of it, really. Also, she's achieved the Susan B. Anthony Award, Legacy Award, and uh, along with long distance swimmer Lynn Cox and polar explorer Anne Bancroft. Today, she's going to talk about her new book, Daring the Impossible Women, Strong Women Take on the World. Boy, do we need strong women, huh? Yeah. And uh, it's my pleasure to. Introduce my former neighbor on Mulberry Street, Carol White. Carol. Yeah, I certainly enjoyed those days working with you, Vic. Through the village, and you still are wonderful. Well, thanks for coming. I mean, it's the middle of Columbus Day weekend, and it's a gorgeous day, <laughs> the middle of the day. So to come to an indoor event is pretty impressive, and thank you very much. Um, so maybe some of you have already read a book about the United Community. Uh, maybe some of you are more familiar even with the Nine Unlimited Silversmiths. Um, maybe you or a relative of yours work for Nine Unlimited. And I thought I'd start by something that I was actually finishing with about Pierpont Noyes. He was the first 20th century president of Oneida Limited Silversmiths. And he implemented the Oneida community's principles so well because they valued their workers primarily. They gave them good wages. They did profit sharing in good times. And then the brass, so-called brass, take pay cuts and depressions and recessions. They never wanted to fire the workers. And the workers never held a strike because they knew that an idle limited cared about their welfare. The company was, and this company was managed by the descendants of the United Community for over 100 years, all through the 20th century. Well, I got the most amazing letter from Pierpont Noyce's grandson, um, Jeff Noyce, and Jeff Noyce's father, Pete Noyce, who's also president of Nine Limited. And so Jeff Noyce is also a tour guide for the mansion house, and I, I do tours too. But I always thought Jeff Noyce really knows the most about Oneida community and Oneida Limited. He worked at Oneida Limited. He just he lives there. I didn't live there. And he sent me this letter one month ago. He's out in Colorado rock climbing right now. And he said, I always considered that I knew and understood John Humphrey Noyce's early days, the founder of the community, in Andover, New York City, and in the field, quite completely. The first third of A Taste of Heaven on Earth, my book, corrected that self-conceit just as completely. How little I knew 
how much more, thanks to you, I had to read this first third of your book a few times over to come to a sense of my, your great-grandfather's spiritual origins. I mean, that just floored me. Because that's exactly why I wrote the book. If I never felt that Jonathan Noyce's spiritual background was sufficiently covered in any other book, and the curator of collections and interpretation of the mansion house wrote a preface for my book, and he said, no other history of the United Community treats founder John Humphrey Noyce as an important American theologian who inspired others to embark <clears throat> on a thrilling journey of communal sharing and spiritual discovery and as a religious experience designed to bring heaven to earth. So you are being offered a remarkable story. Okay, so there's there's the modern mansion house. And let's move on to a picture of John Greenoyce. John Greenoyce taught life's purpose is hearing God's spirit in our heart. And it all began because Noyce's mother, Polly, who was the, the um, sister of uh, President Rutherford Hayes's father. And Polly, had, Polly Noyce wanted all her sons to be ministers and all her daughters to marry ministers. But John, who had just graduated from Dartmouth College, wasn't interested in religion. So what's a mother to do? <laughs> she urged him to attend a four-day revival. And this was the height of the Second Great Awakening in America from about the mid-1820s to the mid-1830s, where itinerant preachers would visit localities and they might be there for days or weeks, sometimes months, and they would convert people in hundreds and thousands. In fact, <clears throat> in, in Rome, every bar and town closed after a 20-day campaign. And in Rochester, 100,000 people were converted in a six-month campaign from September 1831 to March 1832. And religion became the main topic of conversations in taverns and training posts. Prayer meetings were preferred in displays of wealth. Shops closed, philanthropy thrived. And I look around this church, and this church was planned and built at exactly this period of time, 1831, 1832, at the height of the Second Great Awakening. So John Greenoyce had just turned 30 in 1831. No, 20. He just turned 20. He graduated from Dartmouth at 19. He went to college earlier then. And um, he agreed to attend this revival just to please his mother. But he was wary of revivals because, after all, all these level-headed businessmen and physicians and lawyers had succumbed to conversion, and he didn't particularly want that to happen. So after the fourth day of this four-day revival, he came down with a bad cold, bad enough to put him to bed. And so instead of leaving, going back to Brattleboro, where he practiced law, um, he stayed, and he was reading the Bible with his mother. And he found himself thinking, strangely, that really only the, only the matters of God are truly worthy of attention. Hmm. And he thought that most worldly pursuits seem like the eagerness of children for toys and trifles. So he abandoned his legal career. He had to learn Hebrew in order to go to our oldest theological seminary, Andover. And he wrote in his journal, and luckily he kept the journal from age nine all, all the way through his life. He wrote in his journal, hitherto the world, henceforth God. So he 
went to Andover, but he was disappointed because it seemed like, it seemed like, um, can you hear me? It seemed like the students were pursuing more of a kind of safe livelihood rather than uh, what he wanted, which was an education of the heart that would lead to a changed life. So he, he found a, a small society of students there, and they practiced group criticism, group of about exactly this size, where one person would be it, like me. They got to know each other well, and you all would tell me plainly my faults to help me grow spiritually. And John Humphrey Noyes thought, hmm, here's this young 20-year-old. He found it very helpful to see himself as others saw him. So, it resulted, though, in him becoming a severe critic of his own feelings and his own mind. Um, he refused to settle for normal, normal um, human shortcomings that most of us consider inevitable if, if we think about it at all. He said, I can vie with monks in passive piety, but to be an active Christian is another thing. I might forego a thousand pleasures and pray and study to the extent of human ability, yet I shrink from practicing the benevolence I knew Jesus would exhibit. He really mourned I've spent a day without any warm feeling of love for Christ, gratitude to God, or benevolence to man. So the fo he left Andover in the following year um, at Yale Theological Seminary. He practiced systematic temperance, exercise, fasting, and prayer. I could now study for up to 16 hours a day without injury. I have really conquered my nervous system, he said, boldly. I'm cheerful and often happy, communing with Christ and spending not less than three hours a day in prayer. So this is the thing that when I read it, I thought this has really changed the way I think about the United Community. Instead of just seeing it in sort of an outer way, I, I understood what it was all about. Because at age 22, he experienced a vivid consciousness of the presence of God, just the way great mystics, saints do. He wrote, eternal love gushed through my heart, joy unspeakable, full of glory filled my soul, all fear, doubt, condemnation passed away. My heart was clean, and the Father and the Son made it their abode. And from then on, Noise taught that the highest function of our brain is receptivity to suggestions from this spirit. He wrote that this is living by inspiration from God, and he said, This is what human nature, for what human nature was designed, and it's the natural and healthy condition of humanity. Life's purpose is to learn to hear our internal teacher from whom we can get counsel in life. So the Apostle Paul wrote, I live, and yet not I, but Christ in me. And this is what he experienced. In that good spirit that whispers within us, he wrote, we have access to all the experiences and the memory of Christ. Let everyone go home into one's heart many times a day seek to know God for oneself. When we have learned to do that, we can pass unheard through the wreck of matter and the crash of worlds. Dwell deep, for the riches of heaven are here, now, and by receiving wisdom directly from the source, selfishness is purged from the soul. The loving heart is the one essential for living in peace and harmony with all. Now I'm going to talk about the next phase of his life, and another reason I wanted to write the book was to talk about the, um, well, you probably, many of you may know that they practice complex marriage. Everybody was married to everybody in the community 
And it's very easy to see, <laughs> it's very easy to see this as, hmm, well, you know, I don't know, I'll be very judgmental about it. So I just wanted to go into its entire history, make it a little bit clearer in the book. Um, so he married Harriet Holton in 1838, and they formed a, Bible, a daily Bible study in Putney, Vermont, and their one desire was to publish Noyce's teachings. And people, and that's one thing I didn't know about, I thought he wanted to create communities, but no, he didn't. He just wanted to publish his teachings. And people read his publications, and the community just organically grew. People were gravitated to him. It grew to over 30 people in Putney. Well, one day, there was a period of kind of recession and depression from 1837 to 1843. Um, and one day, head farmer George Cragen told Noyce about monetary problems. And he suggested, um, maybe we should spend three full hours every day on Bible study. And John Humphrey Noyce said, I'd rather our land run to waste than we fail of a spiritual harvest. And the community began sharing all property and money based on Acts 2.44. All who believed were together and had all things in common. And then they elaborated on that idea. For all things are God's, and we are dealing with him and his property. Worldly systems of property getting are based on laws written by the strong and crafty rather than by rules of wisdom and justice. And John said, we are immortal spirits and sharers of this common life. Human beings should not be understood as inherently conflicting and destructive. There is infinite depth and mystery in every person, and everything that exists will be to us a shrine of the mystery of God. To know God's love, is to love one's fellow man and oneself. They, the first year of the Bible study was pretty much devoted entirely to 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient and kind. Love envies not and is not arrogant, rude, or resentful. Love does not insist on its own way and neither gives nor takes offense. And they tasted these thoughts on their doors. John Renoy said an interesting thing. With love, the world might be a very comfortable paradise, though its external institutions remain unchanged. Without it, the most perfect organization can only be a well-disciplined bedlam. Fascinating. So, the story begins with the fact they wanted a family, obviously, but in the first six years, five pregnancies, only one son survived. This was fairly common back then. Women had babies every year or two, and half the children died until modern medicine, either in infancy or in the first five years. So, uh, it, it was a terrible problem, and Noyce pledged to Harriet that he would never again expose her to fruitless suffering. We are spiritual beings, he said. Why should we be enslaved by the ceaseless automatic repetition of desire by ruthless impersonal instinct and suffer the destruction of freedom and the limitation of progress? The long march of humanity is improved upon nature. We must end excessive, and therefore oppressive, procreation, and I will live apart from Harriet. So for two years, he studied sexuality, and he discovered male continence, that is enjoying se sexual experience well short of what he termed the propagative crisis. This is superior to the Shaker's total chastity, by preserving the social aspects of sensuality while exercising bodily functions in the spirit of purity. 
Harriet's experience became very satisfactory and my enjoyment was increased. We discovered that this love is a portal to divine communion. Human nature re uh, reaches its normal condition when it is a temple of the Holy Spirit filled with all the fullness of God by toning the nervous system to the divine standard of health with sexual passion fully within the province of the will, men can end the unplanned, unplanned pregnancies that threaten women's health and often their life back then. Male continence was a great deliverance. I told a friend about this and his experience and that of his family was the same. It made happy households. Women are made for God and herself, and not chiefly for the children that she can bear, he wrote. She has a spiritual nature that lifts her up to God, and there, there is, in that there is her highest sphere where there is neither male nor female. To one who appreciates God's creation, man and woman are an endless mystery. I've heard men say, I know all about women. Such an attitude toward women is an insult to human nature. People devote a lifetime to understanding the violin and they say they're just beginning to fathom it. And I must be a poor wooden creature of less worth than a violin. If the mystery of love can ever be fathomed and we know all about each other. No, we're fearfully and wonderfully made only as we become refined in our perceptions and, and delicate in our feelings toward God shall we be delicate and tender in our feelings toward others and treat them fairly. We believe in the power of God over the human heart to abolish selfishness, to make persons who seek not their own but prefer, refer each other's rights and claims. His sister wrote, we believe that Jesus Christ came into this world to make people of that sort and to establish a society of that description. To dissolve and remove the hard shell of selfishness and prejudice that encases persons and keeps everyone isolated from his neighbor requires a miracle and nothing less. Selfishness is a spiritual disease and societal reorganizations may ameliorate it but cannot cure it. Our community's true harmony of love is the ripened fruit of influences operating for years. And after seven years of sharing all things, they were married in every way except physically. So one day, George Cragen, the man who said, maybe we shouldn't spend three whole hours every day on Bible study, he did a lot of sales for the community. They had a store and a farm. He wrote a letter to John Humphrey's his wife, Harriet, and he signed it, I love you as a sister in Christ. No secrets existed in this large family. It was an essential feature of Noyce's communities. So they began a four-month discussion um, they had great love for each other. Uh, they loved each other, not only in word and deed, but even in their thoughts. And should they be fully married to each other? Hmm. Subject to male continence? No one should do anything about what, which they would not be in good conscience to God. They decided. Um, one of the members wrote to another saying, what will the world think of this? But I've learned that to the children of God, what my father thinks is the only question. Nothing is of any value to us that is not valuable to God. So eight years after beginning the Putney community, complex marriage began. That, that was the beginning of it. The community, okay, so then there's a whole other section of how they were invited to come here and in the Oneida Valley with another community of believers. 
And they occupied, in the very beginning, a 15-square-foot log hut that was made available to white settlers by the Oneida tribe, and it was now owned by the Jonathan Bird family. Under the low roof was a sleeping chamber where tall folks could not stand erect except directly under the ridge pole. We've been in such places. A hole under the ground was the cellar, and a lean-to was a woodhouse. A 12-square-foot shoe shop was a school and chapel, and they bought a 26-acre farm contigu contiguous to the sawmill and water power. They built a rudimentary structure for arriving men and boys. Am I, I'm not doing the slides. Ooh. <laughs> All right. Let's, after, I want slide two would be Harriet Noyes. Boy. She is the one that had five pregnancies in six years, with only one child surviving. Okay, next. And there's Harriet that wrote, wrote about how Harriet Noyce. Noyce's sister, who wrote about how selfishness is a spiritual disease and it requires a miracle and no less to overcome it. Next. And this is George Cragen. They wanted to cut short the Bible study. They went on the sales trip and wrote to Harriet. <laughs> Yeah, okay. And there's John Miller that was worried about what the world would think about if they started complex marriage, but he only cared what his father would think. John God. Okay, let's try to remember to do the slide, sorry. Oh. So, in order for women to work along with the men um, in this whole new setting, they had to cut off <clears throat> their long dresses. Women universally wore floor-length dresses, and so they cut them off and they made uh, pantalettes for modesty. There you can get a sense of it. One time, this was unheard of to look like that. The community had uh, visitors, and they, they, they thought the United community was really Quite a wonderful place, but they thought the women's dress was unsightly. And one time, uh, a, whole, a group went down on a sales trip, and they arrived at Grand Central Station, and a crowd began surrounding them, looking at these people as if they were from another planet. Never seen women in pants. These were the first pantsuits. <laughs> and finally, you know, after about 200 people gathered, they had to call the police to avoid a riot. So they, they, they decided, okay, we better have uh, outfits whenever we go into the world. And we had to have long gowns. And so they had long, a couple of long gowns that were short, or for little slim women, medium size, and long. And one time, uh, John McRae Noyce's son and a friend went to visit cousin Rutherford in Washington. Rutherford Hayes was the president from 1876 to 1880. And they arrived at the hotel in his outlandish costumes, just so that the bellboys brushed them off to an obscure room. They carried a carpet bag, the community manufactured carpet bags. They really looked like hicks straight out of, you know, they looked like immigrants straight out of um, Ellis Island. So they, the hotel staff was flabbergasted when the President of the United States drove up in his carriage and got these two strange people and carried them off to the White House. Oh, and also, yeah, Marion, the, the, the friend of Theodora, John Prenos' son, she was a small woman. But the only costume available was art. So they had to take it in, and it really looked baggy and terrible in addition to everything else. Okay, so, a slide seven, Dave. Now you all may know about the, the new house trap. This is famous to this very day. One time we were coming back from a hiking trip, and we stopped um, at this place that had a lot of displays of things, and there was men, um, and they were talking about haunting 
and they right away when I mentioned you know the community and Sewell New House and the New House trap, they said, "Oh yes, that's still the best trap that's ever been made." Well, so I'm saying that it, when they started this new venture in 1848 in Ida Valley, very unlikely candidate was outdoorsman Sewell Newhouse. He knew all of an Ida Lakes bays and swamps, 36 creeks, and all its wild creatures, and he hammered out the Newhouse trap, famous now. He fell in love with El Lisa, and they became members of the Oneida Castle Presbyterian Church. The minister was decrying the unhappy condition of the wicked in Satan's realm. There'll be no Sabbaths there, no churches there, no ministers. Sewell Newhouse retorted from his pew, yes, there will. And he joined the Oneida community, right then and there. And another unlikely joiner was somebody from far northern Vermont, just short of the Canadian border. He was a church deacon, justice of the peace, and sheriff, and he would bring his prisoners home for Maria's homemade dinner and a night's lodging in the stone house that he built. This is the Kinsleys, and they, uh, they sold their valuable farms and they left for the wilds of central New York in a covered wagon with two sons and two daughters, ages 12 to 19. And this family later became directors of Anida Limited Silversmiths. Oh, let's see. So now, um, they wrote, we felt that we were called of God to unite with the people who love God with all their hearts and were unselfish. Laboring to build a society where the love of God would be the prevailing spirit. So slide, next slide. Huh? Yes, this is the slide. So by June, uh, thank you, by June uh, 1848, the community had uh, increased to 51 people. And their neighbors, who all lived in cabins, watched the almost magical appearance of a 60-foot long, 35-foot wide, four-story mansion house. The wooden mansion house is the one farther down to the left there that they first built. So they would go over to Oneida Depot. That was where the railroad wa was um, off of, route, now it's Route 365, um, out of Oneida Castle, about another mile north. Oneida was called Oneida Depot at the time. And they had a good store there where they could buy many of the things they needed for this growing community. Um, okay, so the storekeeper said, one day it's Alan, 